Hello, everyone. Thanks once again for tuning in to another episode of the Recovery After Stroke podcast. Before we get started, I want to address something with you, which you may have noticed that is different about the show when you are listening on your favorite podcast app. Due to the fact that I have not yet been able to secure an appropriate corporate sponsor to help cover the costs of the show, I have decided to switch on a feature offered by my podcast host, and that is to run advertising on some episodes before, during, and after the interview. I do hope that they are not too distracting, and I would love your feedback if they are, particularly if they are inappropriate or annoying in any way. I have avoided switching this feature on for as long as possible, but due to the fact that I have covered the costs for the show since 2017, and with the rising costs of keeping this podcast going, I have no other choice. I will be looking at ways to raise more funds in the near future, which might include a version of the show which is in subscription base for those who prefer not to listen to ads, or perhaps a Patreon page. But I will look at many different options and implement the ones that are best for me, and hopefully they will be the best ones for the listener as well. The book is a perfect way of supporting me and the show while getting amazing value. And you can grab a copy of that by going to recoveryafterstroke.com slash book. Funds raised by the book already are helping to pay for some of the costs of the show, but we are a long way from being cash flow positive. The book tells a story of 10 stroke survivors and the steps that they took that got them to the stage in their recovery where from a personal growth perspective, Stroke transformed into one of those life experiences that was, on reflection, filled with many opportunities for growth and personal transformation. Grab your copy today. This is episode 283, and my guest today is on the second year of his path to recovery after a hemorrhagic stroke. Luca Yelusic, welcome to the podcast. There you go. Thank you. Thanks for being here. Uh, tell me a little bit about what happened to you. Sure. So um, about two years ago, it was actually two two years, uh, just a few days ago, I had a hemorrhagic stroke, um, which uh, affected me uh, quite a bit. Um, and uh, actually, after hearing your episode 267 with Angie Reed. Uh, I thought I might contact you and uh, yeah, just uh, share my experience uh, with it because it was something with uh, Angie's story that uh, that I uh, kind of uh, relate that I could relate to uh, in the in the way that she kind of, from what I understood, tried to just push through and kind of storm through or like force the way through. Uh, kind of getting better and that's often not how things uh, work uh, so you're, yeah I had a bit of you're an interesting guy okay because you're a woodworker and yeah that's true. you know woodwork is all precision and time and care and you yeah. can't force the project to get it to the end because if you force it, it looks terrible and nobody's going to buy yeah. it you were 46 yeah. when you had a hemorrhagic yes. stroke what caused the bleed uh, well, there's no clear, um, uh, the, the doctors uh, suspected AVM, uh, but then after uh, angiography, they they found no AVM. So they said, well, basically it just happened. Uh, and uh, I think I had uh, like reasonably healthy lifestyle when it comes to usual factors. Like I'm, I'm not a smoker, I'm not a drinker, I'm not obese, I, I, I'm physically active and so on. Um, uh, but I, I was at a, a very, very stressful, uh, period in my life. Uh, and, uh, I, I'm, I'm not a doctor and doctors said, well, stress can kind of contribute, but not cause, uh, the stroke. Uh, but I do know that, that I, I, I had, a, I had a very, very stressful, uh, period in my life. Three years prior to stroke, I, uh, divorced from my wife. Uh, and it was my older daughter who didn't take that quite well. So I was quite worried about uh, her. I had a stressful situation uh, at a job, like particularly stressful situation at 
work that dragged for a couple of months. And I also entered the new relationship, which is now very stable and very supportive and, and great. But, but at that time, it was also uh, a number of challenges there. Uh, so it was kind of this situation where, you know, all the important areas, like if at least one of them is kind of good, you have somewhere to turn, you know, if, you, if, you, if your uh, job is a mess, but your relationship works well, then, you know, you kind of have a safe oasis there, but I felt quite a bit cornered and um, at that point, and I'm, I'm sure that had a lot to do. Yeah. Uh, how do you but, typically uh, respond to stress? Do you go quiet? Do you get loud and obnoxious? Uh, how do you deal with when you're cornered? How, how do you respond? Uh, I, I think at, at uh, I think I would say normally, like pr kind of problem solving is 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 uh, a part of my work, uh, and I can tell you a bit about what I do as well. Uh, um, so I think I normally cope with these things fairly uh, well, but but at that. Uh, point I, I think I, I started to feel like you know I, I just did everything wrong and I'm a complete failure and I'm just making mess all around me uh, and it was uh, some kind of uh, some kind of giving up uh, in that like I just it just seemed like everything I did was wrong at that uh, point and if you've um, done that if you've had a couple of bad decisions or things have gone wrong or people are blaming you for things that have gone wrong that may not even be mm. your fault. You do mm. tend to sort of say, okay, well, maybe I'm going to stop doing anything right now. I'm going to stop making decisions. Mm. I'm going to stop mm. taking action. Mm. And it seems like you're withdrawing. It seems like you're, uh, you're not taking responsibility, but in fact, I I'm describing myself now, but in fact, what's happening is mm. sometimes when everything is turned to shit the best thing to do is do nothing and just wait until the wave passes over you and goes away yeah. and then you can sort of reassess and then start making decisions again and start taking action again and start uh, testing the waters to see how things are going to go now in a difficult situation with people and in their relationships you have to allow the other person to go through their process as well their phase of how they deal with the terrible time. And if the two with different ways of de dealing with a terrible, terrible time uh, clash, then it can be chaos. And I feel like what you're describing is that you might've felt like you were, you had no control on influencing the situation positively and losing control was also absolutely making it worse absolutely that that's definitely the the the, the way i felt uh, at that moment uh, like like I, I just couldn't figure out a way to like just make things uh better for me or or other uh yeah people around me uh so i definitely resonate with the way that you explain uh these things and especially with your children when, when it's your children, you want to make it better for them all the time. You want to make sure that they're not hurting, that they're comfortable, that they understand, that they can appreciate your point of view, that they respect your decisions, or that they can forgive you if you've made the wrong decision. Mm -hmm. um, and children just don't play that game. They have their own mm -hmm. way of dealing with stuff. And it might not be correct because they may not also have the skills to uh, correctly uh, approach something that's bothering them. But yeah. it's the wrong time to try and force them as well, isn't it? I mean, it's impossible to force Yeah, absolutely. Them to and then, then, I mean, it's, at some point, you also, also when it relates to children, but when it relates to other things as well, like you understand that you do live kind of in the long run, like you don't live from today from from today till tomorrow. So there's a lot of learnings that happen in today that are very useful uh, at some later point in, in life. So often things are not what they seem in in the moment, but you have to get there yourself, right? Like you have to kind of figure that out for yourself um, in a way. And then, and then when all this stuff is happening, then it mm -hmm. seems like 
the bleed in the brain is also a circuit breaker to all this stuff that happened personally. Yeah. Um, how did you first realize that there was something wrong and that you were, did you get symptoms? What was it like? Yeah, yeah, I did. So, so in the days before the stroke, I was extremely tense. Uh, just like there was some kind of tension uh, that I felt in my body and some kind of spasms, which were not like the usual uh, thing for me. Uh, and then uh, it happened actually uh, when I was in the shower, which I, I heard is not completely uncommon. Uh -huh. uh, that uh, like on the like if, if you're in a like a long warm uh, shower uh, and if you've previously been tense that that can kind of cause the, the sudden change uh, in your uh, whatever the, the blood the temperature or pressure or stuff uh, uh -huh. so I just felt uh, that I almost fell uh, in the shower and, they, and I noticed that like my right leg doesn't hold me and then I tried to grab myself and my right arm also didn't uh, work and I thought all right that's something weird uh, going on uh, but there was nothing with my vision and like you don't know much about stroke uh, unless you're a doctor or unless you're a stroke survivor mm. uh, but uh, I thought okay since like I see uh, on both my eyes, it's probably not a stroke. It's maybe something with circulation, or whatever. Uh, so, so yeah, my my partner took me to a local uh, small uh, hospital, and they said, "Well, you you probably had a small stroke. It's probably nothing terrible, uh, but you need to go to a bigger hospital and get uh, checked." Uh, and then and then I came to a bigger hospital, and then they started doing tests, and then they said, "Yeah, you had a." Uh, you had a bleeding in your brain and uh, we'll kind of keep monitoring you uh, and then see what's next. And uh, then at some point uh, they said it stopped. So, so there's no like further danger and they, they, they were kind of uh, considering uh, surgery, but they then decided not to do uh, anything. And, uh, and, and, and there was that. And then what, what happened was that I think it was like the second day I was in the hospital, I got sick with COVID. Uh, and that didn't really help uh, things because what I what I heard from a doctor is that uh, it's, it's not a very scientific explanation, but, but I guess it kind of makes sense. Like the COVID hits you where, where you're weak. Mm -hmm. uh, and I just had a stroke. So that probably made uh, the fatigue um, uh, worse than mm -hmm. if it would be just uh, from uh, the stroke, because that's the thing that I struggled most with, uh, fatigue and brain fog and, and uh, confu confusion. Uh -huh. uh, so how so bad is fatigue? How much energy did you have to do things for, say, the day? Well, I started uh, at the, the initially it was it was uh, quite difficult, and actually when I started every now and then getting a good day, uh, when I would feel kind of normal, almost normal, uh, it was only then that I realized how extremely tired I am all the other time. Uh, so it was these kind of high points that made me realize, um, yeah. That, that that I really am very different in the other times. So I spent uh, three months uh, off work, uh, and then and then went back to work, um, and and that was quite difficult. So I work primarily as a teacher at the university. I teach design and craft for two different schools, and what is a kind of big part of my work is uh, so-called uh, design build projects or community participatory design build project. So I take a group of students, it can be like 15 or 20 students somewhere to some kind of community. It can be like a small rural community or a hospital or something like that. We stay there for a month and we design and build some kind of uh, space for them. So it can be like an outdoor community garden or, or like an outdoor living room or something like that. And these are beautiful projects. It's a very meaningful thing to do. Uh, but it's also extremely intense. 
uh, very kind of uh, engaged with people, with decision making at many different levels, uh, and so on. Uh, so that was uh, the first thing I did uh, after uh, returning to work, and that was quite quite challenging. I mean, I had uh, help from colleagues as well, uh, but but it was quite a push uh, to to do that. What uh, and then you struggling with was it in getting clear information in knowing what to do was it in in uh telling people think, uh, what what steps to take or what were you struggling with the most i think the most difficult thing is that intense social contacts uh are one of the things that mo that wears me out the most uh so so if i have uh, like a whatever manual workshop task to do on my own uh, that's great. That's I don't have a problem with that. But intense social contacts and intense like settings with many people, airport, train station, something like that. It, it it's like uh, it just sucks out the energy off me uh, immediately. And and computer work kind of similar. Um, but since the essence of these projects is kind of you know man matching people and, and work tasks and stuff, then uh, I'm just uh, struggling with fatigue a lot uh, in that. If you've had a stroke and you're in recovery, you'll know what a scary and confusing time it can be. You're likely to have a lot of questions going through your mind. Like, how long will it take to recover? Will I actually recover? What things should I avoid in case I make matters worse? Doctors will explain things, but obviously you've never had a stroke before. You probably don't know what questions to ask. If this is you, you may be missing out on doing things that could help speed up your recovery. If you're finding yourself in that situation, stop worrying and head to recoveryafterstroke.com where you can download a guide that will help you. It's called seven questions to ask your doctor about your stroke. These seven questions are the ones Bill wished he'd asked when he was recovering from a stroke. They'll not only help you better understand your condition, they'll help you take a more active role in your recovery. Head to the website now, recoveryafterstroke.com and download the guide. It's free. Yeah. Um, it's very common. It's exactly what I suffered from uh, the large crowds. So going to sports events was very difficult for me. Going to a noisy yeah. event where uh, there was a lot of people at a at a, a bar, for example, and then the lighting, and then the noise, and then the it was just impossible. Um, and then also yeah. finding a way to to go back to work. I did some work uh, in an office for about three years to try and get me back on my feet. I remember the first six months was terrible. I, I hardly got anything done and I was constantly mm. fatigued and I would even leave and go into the car and have 10 minutes of quiet time or meditation time or try and sleep just so I could um, recharge and come back and, and do the rest of the day. Uh, it was extremely difficult and I drove an hour to work and an hour home. It was just such a massive day. I was wiped out. Um, but what I found yeah. was over the three years, by the time I got to the the last uh, few months before I left the place, um, I was able to sit in front of a computer for eight hours and actually do some work, participate in those conversations. I didn't need to take rest breaks. Uh, even though I would be quite fatigued and exhausted at the end of it, I didn't need to do what I was doing mm. at the beginning of the job. Um, mm. So it improves, but yeah but it but it does take some time the hardest part for me was other people around me not appreciating what i was going through how did you find dealing with other people who you were working with and how did they react and respond to you well uh i have a very uh supportive partner which uh, helps me a lot uh in this especially since uh like i don't know if you struggle with that but it's kind of it was it it took me quite a while to 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 learn like who I am right now and what what are the things that wear me out and and what are the mm -hmm. things that are that I should avoid and uh, so on. 
Um, but at, at work, uh, initially, I, I also felt just like you described, like I didn't, uh, look, it's, it's just hard for people to understand, uh, like you kind of just expect automatically for someone to, to understand what stroke is about and, and, and all that. I mean, that, I guess that's why you're doing what you're doing, right? Uh, to, to help people. Yeah. Um, we don't want them to ever really understand. We don't want them to know. Yeah, like for real. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Uh, so, so I think that that the, was definitely the case initially at my workplace. Like it wasn't uh, like it didn't come with a lot of, uh, maybe support or understanding. Uh, but I think it is, um, uh, qu yeah, like way better uh, right now. And I had actually just one month ago uh, a kind of a a, a milestone or like a breakthrough uh, moment after uh, a visit to a specialist uh, doctor who, who had a lot of experience with, with strokes and all sorts of neuro neurological uh, stuff. So uh, after I uh, like kind of just tried to push through and kind of work my way through the recovery and all that, and that didn't really, uh, like it, it just like it just started getting worse. Uh, so, so the the like the memory issues and and the fatigue and all these things like it, it, I had a feeling it doesn't really improve, but it's on the contrary, it's getting worse. So then I, in October, uh, I had to take like a fifty percent sick leave, uh, which which helped me a lot because I could balance like work and rest uh, way better. Uh, but it was uh, a month ago that I had a talk with a specialist who, for the first time, explained uh, like the specific specific nature of the stroke that I had. Because I think one big issue for for my recovery was that I kept hearing from doctors like, "Oh, you you had like a small bleeding, so like it's not a big deal." Uh, and so fair enough, uh, but I just didn't understand like why am I so tired and why do I struggle uh, so much? And I kind of kept beating myself up like I should be better. And and you know, come on, just get your ass out of bed and <laughs> go out and do your things and all that. And 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 then for some time you can sort of take it like all right, it takes some time to recover and all that. But at some point, then it, it just it just. Uh, you understand you're hitting your head against the wall. And it was this doctor who said, uh, you had a small bleeding, that, that's correct. But you had it at a very particular point in your brain. And that's a part which is called internal capsule, which he called a uh, neural superhighway. So it's a kind of a spot where, where all the nerves from your body and from your spinal cord pass through to the processing parts of the brain and the other way around. So he said, if you would have like a road job uh, in a factory, you wouldn't uh, have, uh, like you wouldn't feel a big difference from your life before. But with the executive function, like the planning uh, tasks and the multi, multi-level decision-making and all those things, uh, that's affected a lot. And that's why you have the consequences that you have. So even a small injury at that part of the brain uh, can have a very serious consequence. And he said, I had a patient that had a stroke at exactly same spot like you years ago, but a bigger bleeding. And he said, things were not funny at all. Mm -hmm. uh, so he said, you can consider yourself extremely lucky. Uh, so that was kind of like a big, uh, like aha moment uh, for me because it, it it is like almost like okay so like what's happening like it is kind of real you yeah. know uh yeah uh so so i think that explanation from that doctor and and then and then the same doctor called actually my boss at the university and explained to him what's going on so from that moment on i also had quite a different than uh like 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 understanding at my workplace of what's going on and what are the tasks that I can do easily and what are the tasks that I, that I should avoid, yeah. uh, in, at, at least in the immediate future. So it was quite an important thing for me in terms of accepting uh, what happened. Yeah. And, you know, you read a lot about that, like the first step of 
the Cowboys actually to like truly accept uh, what happened. And I think for me, that was definitely that moment and that kind of, that explanation from that doctor. Um, like ag against the thing that I've been hearing before, like, oh, you only had a small bleeding, so yeah, it should be all right. Yeah, yeah. It's place, it, it, they're trying to keep you calm and not too concerned about it, et cetera. But they kind of playing it down. As far as I'm concerned, you hear about people having ischemic or a trans ischemic attack, a TIA, and they call it a mini stroke. And I think it's the worst way to describe it. Like it's a stroke. It doesn't matter if it's a mini or minor or major, it's a problem in your brain and you have to take it seriously. And I think it makes people not take their situation seriously sometimes. Um, I love the fact that you got this doctor to tell you specifically what impacted, what part of the brain was impacted. That's why I have my free download, the seven questions to ask your doctor about your stroke. People can go to the recoveryafterstroke.com, download it for free. And then what they get is they get questions that they can go a form that they can take to their doctor and it has questions. And one of the questions is where specifically in my head is the damage and what does that part of my brain do? And then what hopefully that does is create a conversation that's very different from you had a stroke, you should go home and you should rest. It's specific and the caregivers and the family members who are there then specifically know what you're struggling with and why you're struggling with it rather than guessing. When I went to the hospital, I was told I had a bleed in the brain. It was near the cerebellum, but they didn't tell me what that impacts and what I should expect to be struggling with. So everything that was happening, my wife and I were looking at each other going, is this normal? Is this what I'm supposed to be feeling? Am I having another bleed? We had no idea and it made it really uncertain. So we kept going back to the doctor every time something was to the hospital. Every time something weird happened or if I felt strange, we were straight in the hospital because nobody explained anything to us. Most of the time we went to the hospital, it was a false alarm. But another two times the AVM actually bled again and mm. I ended up having brain surgery. So what I would suggest is for people to get as much information as they can. If they're not certain um, what's happening to them after the initial incident, and if something feels weird, definitely go and get a second opinion. Go to the doctor. Don't wonder. Don't don't guess. Don't um, don't play it down. It's a s serious issue. A TIA, a, a small bleed in the brain, is a bleed in the brain. Yeah. I think that's extremely important because uh, it can it can really like the symptoms can be so different depending on where it happens, uh, and 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 like knowing what are the kind of typical things for the spot where it happens, uh, it can it can be so helpful for mm. uh, the recovery. Like one thing that I uh, read because then later once that doctor explained to me, then I then I went reading about it uh, with that specific term, the the internal capsule. Uh, stroke and and like it totally fits like like silly little things like decision making like it's one thing that I noticed I have a very hard time making decisions it can be like stupid decisions but it's just I like I just cannot make up my mind uh, and and I feel like an idiot like well wait a minute it's like whatever situation it's not a big deal you just make up your mind but I can't uh, and that's one of the symptoms of a stroke in that. Uh, areas it's quite helpful to just know that uh, mm -hmm. so yeah in, like, uh, in that moment when you can't make decisions even simple ones do you recruit other people to help you make the decision or or do you just not make yeah if i can i i i i, I try to uh yeah ask for help if i can mm -hmm. Dep depending on what is the situation so you you were going through a difficult family time uh with your former partner and your daughter and then you had the bleed how did that impact them oh uh, well on on one hand um uh, and and again uh i'm not sure if that's the uh right thing to do but uh i think i really uh, kind of desperately wanted to uh like stay functioning uh and kind of be normal like keep 
con to continue providing uh, whatever the not not only in financial uh, ways but that as well, but also in all the other uh, ways. It's just just like to kind of continue with the normal uh, life uh, as as much as uh, possible. And I think for the uh, large part I manage, but but at at quite a big cost in terms of fatigue and also uh, in terms of uh, like the the cost of my private life. Because if you're not, if the end of the week comes and you're completely, you know, you're a cucumber on a couch. Uh, it's not much of a, a life, right? Uh, so I think that uh, I guess that answers kind of the question because like ultimately that does slow uh getting better in the long term like the, the pushing through and trying to do more than you can so were you trying um, to just pretend that you were as you were before the show absolutely okay absolutely was okay. that to try and make your daughter feel okay about the situation that was happening to you because i kind of i was managing people's emotions a lot so i found that i like leading up to surgery i i was cool as a cucumber i pretended as well even when i was worried that i wasn't worried about the surgery mm. because i knew everyone else around me was mm. shitting themselves they had no they were fearful about what was about mm. to, to come and in order to try and keep them calm i pretended in in certain situations that i was calmer than i actually was even though i was yeah, very yeah. Good for the surgery i was trying to always keep other people relaxed calm i was playing it down it, did you find yourself doing yeah. that to sort of try and keep definitely your daughter not, not with my not with my not with my partner uh i think with with her i was kind of uh yeah uh not acting and or not not playing uh, uh -huh. like uh, i'm better than, be than 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 i am but in many other situations definitely uh and also like uh, i know that in in social situations in in work uh and all like once i start getting tired then most of the energy is spent on trying to look normal yeah. uh and not say something stupid or not uh, you know yeah. which which is which is which doesn't make sense at all i should just kind of bail out and take a rest or whatever leave uh so but, weird. Um, it's so weird but yeah. it's common i hear it a lot people just yeah. want to just go back to the status quo and then they yeah. can't and then the gig is yeah. up and they have to uh fall in a heap and hit rock bottom and then mm. they they realize that they need to make some dramatic changes and then people go oh my gosh i didn't realize you were that unwell yeah yeah but there's something with i heard you say that in one of the uh, interviews like uh ultimately you don't want to do things that got you in trouble in the first place uh but i guess that's what a lot of us just do until you come to a certain point which then i guess marks a turning point in recovery as well and that's a point of acceptance of what happened and acceptance that you have to change things and that you have to just uh go with what your body is telling you and all that uh, but until that point i mean i hear in, in a lot like in a lot of stories at your podcast and other things that i read that people just try to um kind of yeah just get back to the former self as soon as possible yeah. uh it's the worst if it's former. not possible it's the worst one yeah. to go to because that's the one that caused the problems it's the the person mm -hmm. who created the situation i i like you i mm -hmm. i had the contributing i was contributing to the bleed occurring smoking mm -hmm. drinking working too much mm -hmm. not resting enough not having any uh me time i was angry you know i was blaming everybody for all my problems there was so much negativity and so many issues that i was creating that i was creating the perfect storm and this thing in my head just happened to be there and i made the conditions perfect for it to go i've had enough and i'm gonna pop and it's kind of like a it's like a 
a circuit breaker. It's what I mentioned earlier to you. Like for me, it was a circuit breaker. It was something that I look on now and think, if it wasn't for that, I I may have succumbed to a different condition. I might have had a heart attack. Uh, who knows? You know, the smoking and the drinking wouldn't have contributed to something positive. So I see it as like this weird blessing in disguise. Yeah. It was hard yeah, though. I'm not saying it's easy and I'm not promoting stroke. It was but mm. I'm I'm now twelve years beyond the first bleed. And I look back at it and if it wasn't for that, maybe I would have suffered something more serious. Yeah. I uh, I understand. And I'm definitely, especially lately, trying to see the 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 good side of it, like the way that it's uh, forcing me to change. Uh, my life there's there's a lot of uh, good things about it yeah uh, and there's also you know i don't know if you saw the uh there's a short documentary about ram das uh on netflix uh, who had a stroke uh he was just, some kind of spiritual leader so he had a stroke late in his life uh and he says this thing which is a great sentence like i don't i don't wish you stroke but I wish you the grace that stroke brings. Yeah, that's uh, it. Which is quite a profound uh, way yeah, to put it. Yeah. The lessons are uh, they're the best lessons I've ever had to learn. They're, they're, they're profound. I can't, I couldn't have learned them any other way. Mm. Uh, and it's, it, it's disappointing that I had to have a stroke to learn them, but I, I'm not sure if there was yeah. another way for me to learn them. I'm not sure how else I could have learned the lessons that they brought, that it brought. Um, it's really weird. So were you left with any deficits uh, other than the neurological challenges? Or were you left with physical deficits in your body? My right side is uh, not as strong uh, as uh, it, it used to be. Uh, so, so I have a good uh, dexterity uh, in, in my uh, right hand. Uh, but there's a difference. Uh, so especially when I'm when I'm tired, uh, then then it's kind of I'm kind of clumsy uh, with it. Um, but uh, but nothing else, um, yeah. nothing apart from that. A and also, I think um, I think there's a number when it comes to like again, it's something that Angie uh, Reed mentioned in 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 your podcast, like working with your hands. Uh, as something quite important for the uh, recovery, uh, I am. I'm kind of. I'm kind of teaching design through craft with my students. So there's like this premise of of uh, the school, both schools that I work with, is that design is not complete without the act of making. Uh, so whatever you design, you need to make it to really understand the implication of it. So I'm both teaching like design and design skills as well as different making skills mm -hmm. but i noticed that uh, that's something like since i could do less of uh, kind of executive functioning then i started to turn both in the way i teach but also in my hobbies and stuff uh kind of coming back to workshop and coming back to making uh in 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 different ways uh but it's something which is extremely uh beneficial uh for me I love that. When I was young, I was uh, uh, fiddling uh, a lot with old cars. Uh, and then uh, a little less than a year ago, I bought, uh, I, I bought like after, after quite a while, I, like I bought an old car, a 1968 car that needs a lot of work. Uh, and fiddling with that thing for an hour or two uh, per day, uh, it, it really does me good. Uh, both in terms of kind of uh the like just the physical training of dexterity but there's something else that 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 happens um uh with that kind of work and there's an excellent book uh i don't know if you if you know about it it's called the hand uh by frank r wilson um uh, it's called the, the full title is like the hand the uh, and how it's use shapes uh, the brain and something else in human culture some something like that but in any case uh, frank r wilson is a neurologist who kind of uh, 
put forth this hypothesis that brain and hand evolved together. Mm -hmm. And it was the evolution of our hand that affected the change in development of our brain that ultimately enabled the appearance of language. Uh, so kind of the basic premise is that the hand and brain are like intrinsically connected uh, in, in a very beautiful and, and uh, sometimes unexpected ways. Uh, so there is something in that, uh, like dealing with music with crafts, with with these kinds of things, I, I find extremely uh, beneficial for my recovery. And I heard that from other people as well. Yeah, well, I'm from a Greek background. So most of our talking is done with our hands. <laughs> um, <laughs> if you're not moving your hands yeah. everywhere, uh, mm -hmm. you're not really communicating, if you know what I mean. Mm -hmm. And I struggle yeah. uh, to be on the podcast and not use my hands. So I have to put mm -hmm. them down and because it's not yeah. visual. Uh, <laughs> good yeah. for the podcast um yeah. but when you think about what you said like when i think about it instinctively um you there's so much not in there's so much that comes from the communication with hands like there really is our gestures like often when somebody's talking emotional about emotional stuff they're pointing at their heart you know when they're freaking out in their head they're they're their hands are near their head, you know, they're doing these types of, and, and when something has, uh, when you're gutted by something, when something has happened and you feel gutted and, you know, you're really struggling with what just happened, you know, people are clutching their stomach with their hands. It has, uh, the hands have a very significant role in nonverbal communication. You do see mm -hmm. people's hands do all sorts of strange things. And if you don't listen to people, if you're not listening to their words and you're just observing their hands, it's amazing where their hands go and what they do. Um, and if you if you think about what you said earlier about design, right? So there's one thing to do a design of an object and create a CAD 3D render and to be able to visualize it at the top and the bottom. It's a certain amount of skills a certain part of your brain gets activated and you're able to visualize that before uh, you render it. Then you render it, then you see it, your visualizations come to life. But then to use your hands and to craft the raw object, the raw, the raw piece of timber and to actually fine tune it and make it look the way you intended is another next level of ability and skills and the hand has to play a role in every stage it has to play a role in the rendering it has to play a role in the construction it has to play a role in developing the form of the objects and you could see how if somebody only ever did design it's like what they say about architects and builders you know architects oh yeah they're fantastic all they do is put drawings on paper, but they've never built a house, what would they know about installing a window, for example? Mm -hmm. right? It's it's kind of true. It's that you you miss a big piece of the uh, of the process if you're only involved in one step of the process and then the other step is done by somebody else. I think that designers and architects would be far better at their skill, at their craft, if they took a project from concept to end result because then they were absolutely because then they're able to understand um where in the design they need to make an alteration to make the construction easier for example and vice versa uh so i feel like i feel like your job of say designing a space or putting something together and then being involved in the project is helping your recovery because neuroplasticity has to happen in far more places in your brain than in somebody who just did the design work and then handed that project over. I, I was telling a friend of mine whose daughter recently had a bleed in the brain. She had an AVM. She was 17 at the time. She's doing really well now. Um, but she was a diver. So She's somebody who goes onto a board, jumps up and down different heights, 
twists her body in the air, repositions it, realigns it, and then finds a way to land in the water to make the smallest splash possible. Mm -hmm. And when I was being told about the rapid pace of her recovery, I wasn't surprised to hear that because she has far more neurons in her brain that are related to movement and how to achieve an outcome with her body than I do, for example. She's 17. She's got that advantage as well. But she also has this additional skill. And even though she's left with left side deficits, numbness, tingling, um, proprioception issues, she still has all these other additional neurons that she can use to rewire the parts of her brain that were impacted and to give her more um, uh, more ways to uh, bring back things that were lost because there's just more pathways there already. Unlike me, I never dived in my life. So mm -hmm. I'm kind of sitting behind the eight ball. And this is the thing about exercise as well, where what you do with your hands on the car, I consider a form of exercise. It's coordinating the brain, the hands, thinking, um, problem solving, decision making. It's doing it all, all at the same time. It's such, it's like a sport. It's like running around on a field and being physically fit. And then that's why it's so important to get into a physical activity after stroke. And it doesn't matter what level of deficits you have. What you're doing is you're creating so much neuroplasticity so much potential for change and rewiring that it's the definitely it's the and, at, and at the same time it can be on a on a level which is manageable and not kind of overwhelming correct um for like for for the i guess for the right kind of brain injury and for the right kind of person that can be like real life saving uh um, for for the recovery yeah and i encourage it and i love I love what this book suggests that the hand and what did you say the which part of the, they they so so here I, I read it quite a while ago I mean I read it because of my work and not because of uh, stroke uh, but but his uh, hypothesis is that that it was the the evolution of uh, actually tongue not the hand as a whole, but the way that our thumb evolved compared to other primates caused our brain to rewire, mm. uh, which ultimately enabled uh, the appearance of language and other and other things, which makes us different than than other primates. Mm -hmm. uh, so, so you can kind of yeah, like twist that idea and like possibly use your hands as a way to reclaim uh, parts of your brain. Uh, maybe. I'm reading the title on Amazon. I just found it on Amazon. And the title goes, The Hand, How Its Use Shapes the Brain, Language, and Human Culture. Perfect. Exactly. That's the book. Yeah. 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 So how many years has it been now since the first bleed? Since the bleed? Two years. Two years. And is the blood clot, uh, has it gone away? The blood that was in your head, have you seen new scan i guess yeah I, I had a like i had the angiography uh like two months after the stroke um as, as i mentioned before where they tried to see if there is avm that caused it or something uh and and they said yeah it's it's like it's all good with that you should just uh, kind of there's nothing more that we could do so you you should just kind of proceed with your whatever physiotherapy and stuff and and like go on with your life yeah that's a good place to to get to yeah yeah how has what has stroke taught you um i think definitely uh listening to my body um mm or listening to my body or listening to myself, uh, whichever way you want to put it, uh, in ways that I, I didn't really know how to do uh, before. And I'm still learning that uh, big time. Uh, I remember when I was working with the physiotherapist, I had a quite an unusual, quite an interesting 
uh, person as a physiotherapist. So he told me, he gave me some exercises to do, like in the gym, like walking in a straight line and um, uh, whatever, with support, without support, one eye is closed and, and stuff. But he told me, you need to do, you need to do, do things that that are okay for you. That's that's extremely important for you, you now. You need to do what you're comfortable with. Uh, I said, all right. And then we're doing these exercises. And then he tells me something, uh, to do something where I almost fell. And he, and he said, why did you do that? I said, well, you told me to. I said, yeah, but I also told you that you need to do things that are good for you. You know, so... So it's kind of, and I remember that so many times. Like it doesn't matter if you told me to whatever do something on the line. If that doesn't work with me, it was such a simple, uh, simple kind of trick to prove like you moron. Like you just did something that's not okay for you, <laughs> and, and like you 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 forgot it. <laughs> um, so so I think that's a that's definitely a big. Uh, lesson to you know to, to to say stop and and to think is this really okay for me uh now or, or not and, and like you said uh, yourself like it, it's kind of sad that that it's it's stroke that has to teach you these things uh but i guess there was no other way for that uh to happen no um, other way oh, i very yeah. comfortable describing myself as a thick head i have to learn the hard way and there's no other mm. way uh, you can bring me to something gently and calmly and and simply, and it just doesn't work. My brain doesn't work like that. I have to get whacked over the head, so to speak. Um, what was the yeah. hardest thing about stroke for you? I think uh, uh, accepting the the, the 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 new reality and ex accepting that life is not. You know the life, life, and and career and stuff. It's not like a straight line or a straight path, and there are things that just happen uh, in a way that you didn't plan, uh, big time. Uh, because at like uh, about a year and a half, like, like roughly half a year ago, I was getting quite grim uh, because the recovery just wasn't really going the way I kind of thought it would. Uh, so it's getting quite dark uh, in 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 that and and kind of you know just uh, having these thoughts. All right, I maybe I just won't be able to do what I kind of really like to do uh, professionally and and in other ways. And you know all these thoughts like who's gonna uh, will I just stay alone? Will I you know have a job? Will I have a source of income? Will I have the support from people? You know, will it just be a kind of a, a, a cripple that is not able to take care of himself and, and, and all these things. That was quite th that can get quite tough. Reasonable questions as well. In the face of what has happened to you, they're very reasonable questions. Yeah. And your identity is getting mm -hmm. challenged and your future is mm -hmm. uncertain. And yeah, I mean, I think everybody who's been in your situation has asked themselves the same questions. And yeah. Uh, I I found myself waking up in the middle of the night and going to dark places, you know, when mm -hmm. everything's quiet and I've just gone to the toilet and I need to go back to bed and I'm walking back to bed and then my brain just starts going, everything's shit, everything's terrible, you're never going to get through exactly. this. And, all that. and it was like... N night night is the worst, man. Yeah. 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 And yeah. I spoke to my psychologist about it and she told me there's a specific... Uh, time in the middle of the night it's roughly between you know one and three in the morning or four in the morning if you mm. wake up in the middle of the night it's called the witching hour the witching hour mm. now i've heard of it before and, I, and and i was like and and what what happens during the witching hour she goes dumb shit stuff that you shouldn't be thinking you start thinking and then you can cause a loop and a, a cycle and it's very common of the negativity and if you know about it, you just tell yourself you're you've woken up during the witching hour and you're just playing the unnecessary loop in your head and you can just forget about it and go back to bed and then wake up in the morning and you'll see things are different. And that's what mm. I try to do. I try and do that because yeah. 
my head never used to that's do. That's exactly it. Yeah. That, that's exactly what, what you describe. I mean, that 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 hour, and then the you know, certain kinds of thoughts that don't normally appear during the daytime. They they do appear at that time, and then they kind of mess up with you. Um, but what I what I did find out uh, that that is extremely uh, helpful, and I and I heard you talk about similar thing is uh, is the good routines and, and good rhythms uh, of things uh, and practices like meditation and journaling and and for me like uh, like uh, it's extremely helpful for me to make a plan uh, for every day. And then try to stick to it. And then if it works, it's good. And 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 then if I blow it, I I, I kind of I, I blow it. But but it's really good if I can stick to it. For example, not work more than uh, two hours uh, in in one go. So work two hours, have a little break, then work more. Uh, and yeah, like uh, doing your meditation every morning, journaling every morning, uh, no screens in the evening um which was kind of difficult to stick to uh but if i manage that that helps me a lot um so kind of yeah trying to develop good discipline around things that that uh i know are helpful that then also helps with having good sleep and not going to those dark places in the night yeah i uh I used to just be happy that I was, I had enough energy to cook dinner for the family during, mm -hmm. during the time when I was home alone and everyone was, mm -hmm. my wife was back at work and the children were at school. I would do nothing all day just so that I had enough energy to go buy the ingredients and cook dinner and make sure that we ate dinner together. That was it. And if I did mm -hmm. that, I achieved my goals for the day and I was really, really happy. Um, mm -hmm. And then as as things started to improve, I found myself getting through some heavier days of work. So getting to the point where, you know, that list, I made it a bit larger. And then by the time I got to three o'clock, I would be wasted. And then there would be, say, mm. four or five or six things still on the to-do list. And I, and I just knew they're not getting done. That's it. Under no circumstances is it possible mm. for me to sit down and do that. Because if I do those things, I'm going to suffer for it tomorrow or I'm going to yeah. uh. not rest before bed and I'm not going to get a good night's sleep and it's going to be terrible. So mm. I got good at feeling comfortable with saying tomorrow is another day. The list is still going to be there. I'll just do it tomorrow mm. instead of yeah. trying to to get to the bottom of the never ending list. I mean, the the list of tasks never ever ends. And it's like, all right, that's it. We're done. We're done for today. And if somebody contacted me and said for work, especially, and said, oh, what about this? What about that? I'd be like, yeah, can't do it right now. It has to happen another. Yeah. You have to wait. Yeah, exactly. But I think that was quite, uh, I, I assume that was also quite a uh, learning for you at some point. Uh, but I know it was difficult for me because, you know, at some point uh, you kind of have a feeling that you move through life because you don't leave things for another day, mm. but you do them. You, you do as much as you can. You make your like good use of your time and, and, and like you do as much as you can in one day and not leave things for tomorrow. Uh, because at some point you just assume you have more or less unlimited uh, source of uh, energy, especially when you're young and and, and all that. Uh, but then uh, after stroke, it's just a different uh, distribution of resources. And it depends uh, so, what's the most important thing to you. So you can still yeah. allocate time to the most important things to help you move through time and achieve your outcomes. Yeah. Yeah. And then it's yeah. good at teaching you that's not that important. Yeah. You actually don't need to do that right now. And you can let that go. And you could use that time in a constructive way by doing nothing. Because for me, mm. it was very constructive to do nothing. Because mm. that meant I rested, recharged my batteries, felt better, was able to interact with my family. That was all positive things. So doing nothing really became very constructive, very mm. uh, 
it became a task that was actually really useful to do, uh, which I didn't do before. I didn't realize. Mm. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. It's just different kind of prioritization. Yeah. yeah. Less is more. And that's mm. a good yeah. lesson to learn. Less is more, especially mm. when uh when you have to you have to use the energy in your battery uh efficiently because you only get so many lines of battery for the day once they're done they're done that's it the next day is in is mm -hmm. another day we'll, we'll we'll reassess and go again what would you like to tell other stroke survivors who are listening to this that quite early on in their recovery perhaps or they've been going through it for a little while um what's your one piece of advice or encouragement that you'd like to give well um funny enough i heard that early on and 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 somehow like it just doesn't get to you until it gets to you uh but since my mom is a doctor and she worked with some stroke patients in in her uh practice and she said it's it's quite important that you don't get fixated on uh becoming who you were before the stroke as soon as possible but to understand that you can also be someone else and that's okay uh and i kind of really understand that now uh and although i heard it i was told that right after the stroke but it's just a different kind of it's a different thing if you you know have kind of intellectual understanding of uh something or like if you really understand something in your body and kind of in your bones uh but i think that's the most important thing like you don't necessarily have to get back uh to who you were before uh you're someone different and that can be a beautiful thing yeah and your, essence that, that can... is, your essence is the same yeah. but how you yeah. go about uh participating in the world or responding to how the world is can can evolve is it an evolution is it is it an evolution how would Definitely. you describe it yeah I, i'd say so and and you know all the spiritual uh teachings uh tell you that uh, uh letting go of things or accepting what is is super important uh to move through life um i would definitely say that that once you take that in uh that's when stroke can become the best thing that ever happened to you like you say on that note thank you so much for joining me on the podcast you're welcome bill thanks a lot for what you're doing i so immensely appreciate it it's extremely help it was extremely helpful uh to me on this uh journey to 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 listen to many episodes of your uh podcast i appreciate it immensely thanks for joining us on today's episode get a copy of my book about stroke recovery from amazon or go to recoveryafterstroke.com book to learn more about my guests, including links to their social media and to download a transcript of the entire interview, go to recoveryafterstroke.com slash episodes. Thank you to all those who have already left a review. It means the world to me. Podcasts live and thrive because of reviews. And when you leave a review, you're helping others in need of this type of content to find it easier. And that is making their stroke recovery just that little bit better. If you haven't left a review and would like to, the best way to do it is to go to iTunes or Spotify, leave a five-star review and a few words about what the show means to you. If you're watching on YouTube, uh, you already know that I love responding to comments on the YouTube interview. I appreciate it if you like the episode and to get notifications of future episodes, subscribe to the show on the platform of your choice. If you are a stroke survivor with a story to share, come and join me on the show. The interviews are not scripted. You did not have to plan for them. All you need to do to qualify is be a stroke survivor. If you have a commercial product that you would like to promote that is related to stroke survivors to recover, there is also a path for you to join me on a sponsored episode of the show. Go to recoveryafterstroke.com 
slash contact, fill out the form explaining briefly which category you belong to, and I'll respond with more details on how we can connect via Zoom. Thanks again for being here, listening, uh, interacting, understanding, appreciating. I appreciate you. See you on the next episode. Importantly, we present many podcasts designed to give you an insight and understanding into the experiences of other individuals. Opinions and treatment protocols discussed during any podcast are the individual's own experience, and we do not necessarily share the same opinion, nor do we recommend any treatment protocol discussed. All content on this website and any linked blog, podcast, or video material controlled this website or content is created and produced for informational purposes only and is largely based on the personal experience of Bill Gassiamis. The content is intended to complement your medical treatment and support healing. It is not intended to be a substitute for professional medical advice and should not be relied on as health advice. The information is general and may not be suitable for your personal injuries, circumstances, or health objectives. Do not use our content as a standalone resource to diagnose, treat, cure, or prevent any disease for therapeutic purposes or as a substitute for the advice of a health professional. Never delay seeking advice or disregard the advice of a medical professional, your doctor, or your rehabilitation program based on our content. If you have any questions or concerns about your health or medical condition, please seek guidance from a doctor or other medical professional. If you are experiencing a health emergency or think you might be, call triple zero if in Australia or your local emergency number immediately for emergency assistance or go to the nearest hospital emergency department. Medical information changes constantly. While we aim to provide current quality information in our content, we do not provide any guarantees and assume no legal liability or responsibility for the accuracy currency or completeness of the content. If you choose to rely on any information within our content, you do so solely at your own risk. We are careful with links we provide. However, third-party links from our website are followed at your own risk and we are not responsible for any information you find there.